Hello to everybody today to our latest podcast and today we have a really special guest. Uh, actually, I would argue this guy is one of the smartest guys in the solar industry because you know what? He's not just in the solar industry. If you're smart, you do many other things, not just solar. And we've got uh, Ben Masters today from Solar Hub in Canberra, but you guys do in Canberra, but also the south coast of New South Wales. So got a branch in Melbourne as well. So yeah. tell me, uh, how long you been in solar, Ben? Look, we started the business um, about 14 years ago now, so quite a long time. I'd probably considered a you veteran, look, I you guess. You look too young for that. <laughs> well, it's aged me. <laughs> I look a lot lot younger back then these days. There's grey hairs um, everywhere, uh, grey beard even. So, no, it's been, um, it's been an interesting ride. Like most companies that sort of started out back then, we've seen – um, the ups and the downs, and and those times unfortunately um, haven't gone away. We've seen a recent, um, I guess, case of that with the New South Wales battery scheme. It just sort of feels like Groundhog Day, yes. back to government sort of intervening, pr- promising rebates, um, a trough, a peak. It's it's a tough industry to be in, but a rewarding one. I think what we've done over that time is built a really good business um, with great staff, a um, really good brand. We really keep the customer's best interests at front of mind when we're designing systems. So it's it's yeah been enjoyable and rewarding, but um, certainly um, very, very challenging. Right, right. So to give you a bit of background there, so what happens is, let's say you're running around, you have your business running, and then the government decides to help you and mm-hmm. announce the rebate in six months' time. What happens? Well, the problem is people stop buying batteries for that period of time, don't they? Because they're waiting for the rebate. So during that period, we have our own installers that, you know, don't have work to do. And, and we've just sort of got to ride it out for that period of time. So it's it's bad policy to implement um you know, rebates like this, really what should have happened either um, they announced it right before it was due to start um, or potentially considered some sort of retrospective arrangement where we can provide that rebate for today, but perhaps we can't claim it off the government until until November. And look, I know um, uh, New South Wales... New South Wales government and uh, industry associations are looking at some changes possibly to bring that date forward or allow us to provide that rebate earlier. Mm. Um, And I'm sure the industry would welcome that. Right, right. Look, it would make sense that let's say from 1st of August or so, they let you actually start claiming it. Correct. And, uh, but then you can only cash it in when they have the infrastructure behind it. But uh, yeah, when politicians get involved in solar, I haven't seen many good outcomes, I'm sorry to say. No, there haven't uh, been. I mean, probably the only thing that's been good policy, I think, in our industry is the STC scheme. mm. I mean, that's been around now for, what, nearly 15 years. Mm. Um, It's been a reliable way to incentivise solar uptake. You know, we've got some of the highest uptake in the world, and I think in a large part that's due to a scheme that really hasn't changed. When it was first designed, you know, the rebate ticks down every year all the way out to 2030. So it's a known quantity for installers mm-hmm. and customers. Um, and it's really built the industry here in Australia. So that's good policy. Good long-term thinking is what we need, not sort of short-term vote-winning policies. Those aren't good for industry. Mm. Well, um, you know, you kind of, um, we're kind of in the podcast, right? where we kind of want to be normally <laughs> halfway through the middle. Yeah. Because I really want to find out. So you were what? Were you an electrician? And one day you fell over a solar panel or how did you all start it? <laughs> um, actually, a, a, a software developer or engineer by trade. Um, I spent 12 years um, working on software in various industries from sort of banking to insurance to logistics. Um, I I got into solar really because I was quite interested in it. And the person I started the business with at the time was really passionate about it too. And she had a degree um, in environmental science and um, she was actually working for another solar company at the time. And I said, look, you know, how about we do this ourselves? I think we can do a better job, you know, and that's sort of how it started. So um, I worked two jobs for a really long period of time there, but, you know, very quickly the business took off and um, I got more heavily involved. And I, and I think my my background is uh, in software development has really helped the business. You know, we're very forward thinking um, with the software and the solutions that we provide to customers. And these days the home energy systems are just, you know, one big solar platform, uh, software platform, if you like. There's lots of integrations between devices. There's data about how they're performing each day that customers have got to look at and visualize. So I think some of that experience has certainly helped um, helped our business. So it's not just about slapping a couple of panels on a roof when it comes to solar? No, Solar Hub prides itself on designing solutions that um, provide the most benefit to customers. So that starts with a, an assessment of someone's energy bills. Um, we then look at obviously the available roof space how much we can fit, 
Um, ideally, we're fitting as much as we possibly can on the roof, but we you don't want to oversize it either. If, if people are only home at the evening times, um, there's only two of them and they don't use a lot of energy, you know, then we'll go for a slightly smaller system. But if it's a big family, really high energy users, they want to leave that air conditioning on all the time, all year round, then of course they're going for a 10, 13, 15, even a 20 kilowatt system for some of these bigger premises. So yes, as I said, Solhub really prides itself on that design element. Um, we're not just slapping cookie cutter systems onto roofs. We sit down with customers in their homes, talk to them about their energy use now and the, their, what their energy use is going to look like in the future. Are they going to buy an EV, for example? You know, mm. that would obviously change what we would do from a design point of view. So yeah, we we certainly value um, that customer engagement and, and pride ourselves on designing solutions that are the right size for customers. So when it comes to Solar Hub, it's not just your customers who have to get educated about their whole consumption pattern, but mm. your sales staff actually has to be on top of that too. They can't just be mm. cookie cutters. How mm. does that work? Not at all. So when we recruit, this really starts with when you bring people into your business and the type of people that you're looking for. You know, we don't hire traditional salespeople. Usually our salespeople have got either a background in engineering or environmental science. Perhaps they might have a trade background. Um, so we look for people that... Um, uh, looking for good and en well-engineered solutions for customers, not just sitting there trying to sell them something and walk out the door. So that really starts with how we recruit. And um, as part of our job description is having a technical aspect um, and, a, and a technical expertise uh, within those teams. So all of them, um, uh, no, I'm not saying they know as much as our installers, but they, we, we try and get them as close to that sort of knowledge base as possible. Right, right. So what services you do nowadays? You started with solar, you're doing yeah. more than that? Yeah, we've expanded a lot in the last few years. I mean, customers now want to see um, that full home electrification uh, uh, package um, from installers. So we recently added um, air conditioning um, to our suite of products that we offer. We also offer uh, hot water systems as well, EV chargers. We all the, we actually go all the way down to induction cooktops, which you know we don't do a lot of them. But really, the last thing typically that someone will want to change over um, to get off gas is the cooktop. I know for me, I'd done the whole house. I had got the solar, the battery, um, the reverse cycle air conditioning, swapped over the hot water, but I held on as long as possible to that you know gas cooktop because I do like I do like cooking a lot. Surprisingly, um, when I changed over to really good induction cooktop, I actually came to grips with it fairly quickly. I mean, it, there's some real advantages to induction cooking uh, and certainly the bill savings at that point were really high for me because all I had the gas connection into my home for was the was the gas cooktop. So it was really nice to be able to ring up the retailer and say, hey, come and dis disconnect that gas meter, please, and, and never got it, haven't got a gas bill since. Wow, wow. Okay. So you're saying to people that really that electrification is that – unstoppable now? I think so. I mean, we live in Canberra where the government's very progressive. Um, I know both the ACT and Victoria have, have, have set dates for when um, they're going to switch the gas off. So that's really incentivizing um, homes, home electrification. Um, so yes, I think it's almost inevitable now. Um, the gas supply um, is becoming a bit of an issue. The gas price has obviously been going up considerably in Australia. And if you can electrify your home and power that from a solar and battery that you've purchased yourself and is your own generator on on your own roof. And certainly the return on investment um, getting off the gas is really quite high. You can't generate your own gas on site, but you can generate your own electricity. And that's the key thing. True. But I mean, in Canberra, you do have cloudy days. You sometimes don't get enough solar. Mm. Uh, is a battery a solution in those cases? Definitely. And the batteries are really starting to come into their own now, I think, from a from a payback uh, perspective. Uh, the feed-in tariffs are going down, unfortunately. You're getting a lot less for your exports uh, to the grid now than, than you might have in previous years. You know, once upon a time, you know, I recall days where you were getting paid 20 cents a kilowatt hour, for example, for your feed-in. Now you're lucky if you get three, four, five cents for your feed-in. Um, and there's even talk about it going even lower than that. And this is where a battery plays a really important role. It charges during the day from your solar system, often when you're at work, you know, not using any energy. Um, and then when you get home at night and you turn on your air conditioner, um, you start cooking, you can discharge that battery into your home and use all that solar power mm -hmm. that you were generating the day yourself um, rather than exporting it. So this is where batteries are coming into their own. The costs are coming down 
slowly. Um, there are rebates as well coming uh, mm. for batteries, which will make them even more of a um, promising uh, option for customers. So, uh, yes, I think it's inevitable that we will get off off gas. It's only a matter of time, um, and electrifying your home is 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 definitely something you should start the journey now. It's not just do it all in one go. I mean, it'd be nice to have all the money to do it in one shot, but certainly as things fail in your home, like your hot water system fails, you should look at an electric option. Mm, mm, mm. A couple of years ago, the New South Wales government, for example, gave you money to get rid of your old electric hot water heater. Mm. But nowadays, I actually find electric hot water heaters can work very well with solar. Can you explain? Yeah, there's two options for uh, hot water. You can either use an, an element, a standard element tank. So mm. it's a bit like a big kettle where it's, you know, uh, heating up the water from a resistive element in the tank. So that's just your traditional way of doing it. But there's also hot water heat pumps as well. So um, Before you get onto that yeah. one, but those ones you could then fire up and run through the solar? Of course. So anything that sits behind the meter that uses electricity can be powered from your solar system. Mm. Now, it's not directly happening. It's not like the solar is going you know, directly from the inverter straight into your hot water tank. It's going to a number of things in your home and the hot water tank is just one of those things. Um, heat pumps uh, and uh, standard storage tanks uh, can both be smart controlled now though, right? So you can look at an immersion controller for a hot water tank where it will turn the element up and down in the tank depending on how much solar you have available. And the same with hot water heat pumps. You know, these things can be set on timers to run during the daytime. Mm. Um, some of the new ones have smarter control. So they're looking at what your solar is doing and heating the hot water accordingly. Uh, so you, so it's the solar, basically you're gonna have all these other uh, appliances and elements in the house. So it becomes kind of like a bit of an orchestra, is it? It does, and uh, this is where there's a lot of innovation occurring at the moment. You're seeing it from the manufacturers, you know, the Enphases of this world, the Fronius of this world, the SunGrow, they're all looking at uh, expanding their technology further into the home beyond just the solar inverter. So we're seeing that happen um, aggressively now. But you've also got independent companies looking at this too. You've mm. got companies that are looking at providing hardware and software um, uh, that can talk to all these devices and orchestrate all these devices. I mean, even things like Google Home, Alexa, all these things are pretty capable of controlling devices in your home. So it's a bit of a race we're seeing at the moment between the traditional solar manufacturers that are looking at getting further into the home and the uh, smart home uh, device manufacturers that are looking at providing control and apps for you to use in your home, in your home as well. But I mean, the end customer really doesn't want to get involved in delving in if this one is winning the race or that one is winning the race. Mm. What kind of advice can you give there? Look, ultimately, it depends on who you are and there's multiple different types of customers. Some people are really, really interested in this stuff. They mm. want to see all the data. They want to, you know, they want an app that tells them exactly what the soul is doing, what the battery is doing, when the air con's on, what the temperature is, and they're right into it, you know, and that's a, a whole swathe of customers that want to see that level of data. But for the most part, Marcus... Um, people just want a lower bill. Ultimately, that's the thing that customers are driven by. Mm. They're looking at their bill go up and up every year, and it's not going up by a little bit. It's not going up by 2 or 3% like inflation. In some cases, it's going up 10, 15, 20, 30% each year. And those costs are getting exorbitant, really. Mm. I mean, mm. the average home is probably spending somewhere between three and four grand a year on electricity now. You know, yeah, your, your hand shakes when you open the envelope. It's, exactly. <laughs> and, and if you know, you, you're sitting there and starting to make – um, decisions about what you can or should and shouldn't do in your home. Should I turn that air conditioner down? Should I leave it off potentially? Because no, I don't holidays want to this it. summer. Correct. And so the best way to tackle your bills is to take control back. You know, the retailers aren't acting in your best interests. So you need to act in your best interests and partner up with an installer that is acting in your best interests. Uh, and the best way to start is with solar, add a battery on next. Get off gas is probably the third thing you consider doing. All these things are going to reduce your energy costs and shield you against further price rises. That's the thing. When you get your bill next year and you're generating your own energy, then who cares if it's gone up by a few percent? You're not really paying anything anyway, mm. right? So it doesn't matter to you. And that's the key thing. I would say when the EV comes really into the fullness, then basically some roofs won't be big enough. Is that right? Correct. And I mean, modules, um, the solar modules have become a little bit more efficient year on year, but that rate's really quite slowed down. And so, yes, you're right. We be, start to be constrained um, by by roof space, by available roof space. There's not enough of it. Um, EVs are an interesting one because 
yes, you're going to do a, a, a good chunk of your charging at home each day, but you're also probably going to charge um, on public infrastructure as well, um, wherever you're parking your car. So maybe it's in a car park. Um, those car parks have got EV chargers um, through them and you're charging up there, possibly at a subsidized rate because the cost during the day of, of energy now is really quite low. You look at the wholesale rates for electricity during the day, because there's so much solar around on the grid, it's really quite low. So I think the, the most obvious way to combat not having enough roof space, for example, for solar is to charge your vehicle probably during the day on public charging infrastructure that are offering you subsidized um, energy because they're charging it off solar. So that's something that Solar Hub have been looking at, um, and we've got a solution called Solar Hub Charge, uh, where we're putting in public charging infrastructure on sites where we've got solar, right? So these could be on a commercial building, on a car park, on a factory roof, um, and allowing customers to charge up their car during the day at a subsidised rate. And that's what we're doing with Solar Hub Charge. I really find it very strange that the energy retailers are complaining about all these extra solar in the system in the middle of the day, mm. because now with EVs coming, we've got a perfect source which can take all that uh, solar as long as we put some interesting tariffs together. Mm. Why isn't that happening any faster? I don't know. I mean, EV adoption over the last couple of years has obviously uh, increased rapidly. It's tapered off a little bit over the last six to 12 months, but I'm a long-term believer uh, in the EV industry. I do think <coughs> that over the next five to 10 years, we are going to see some significant uptake. The cost of EVs is coming down rapidly. Um, and it's not just the Teslas of this world driving it. You've got companies like BYD, um, which are making cheaper vehicles, and that's going to uh, lead to wider spread adoption of EVs through the network. The problem with putting public charging infrastructure in a lot of the time is that the grid itself is usually the constraint. You know, as much as we would have um, thought <laughs> the, the, the grid operators were, you know, investing wisely and upgrading the infrastructure over the last 10 years with all that money we've been giving them, they really haven't invested enough. And so, um, putting in public charges where you've got sort of really high demand, um, high peak power within those charges, it is going to put strain on the grid. So we've got to be pretty smart about where we put this charging infrastructure. That's the biggest constraint at the moment. It's not so much that the wholesale price of solar is cheap during the day, it's that actually finding really good places to put these public charges is hard because there's not enough investment being made in the networks. I say put it all in the Aldi car park. <laughs> yeah, well, that's one good place, you know. Um, but we need to put it in all sorts of places. We need charges everywhere mm. to take advantage of this in every car park, you know, on, on you see them on light poles as well. You know, we're going to need them um, in all sorts of places. So wherever you park your car, you put up, you plug it in and away you go. Because mm. not only um, uh, uh, do you want to be potentially charging from these things, but having your car plugged in, does provide, if it's orchestrated well, um, the networks with the ability to potentially use a little bit of that energy in your batteries to support the grid if you need to, right? So there's lots of smart things that you can do with, with EV chargers. So I'm coming back to my orchestra sample. So it's really <laughs> like where the old power station had it all generated once centrally and it's sent out all that way, when we're now getting cars that are looked into the grid when we get batteries that support the grid, it's kind of a backward and forwards constantly and solar is the driver of all of that. Is that where the future is going? Definitely. I mean, these cars are mobile, but you can take that energy that you've um, uh, charged your car up during the day, you can drive home. At some point you'll be able to plug it in um, and use that energy in your home at night. Right? So if I have a blackout, yeah. my car could actually keep my house going, Definitely. Is it? I mean, we've got some work to do on the standards and all these things, you know, before that becomes a reality, but that is not far off. Um, and that's um, going to mean that customers might need to buy energy and any energy from the grid, right? These cars have 70, 80 kilowatt hour batteries. That's significantly more than most homes need I use or require. nine or 10 at hot night. So if yeah. I walk in with a 80 kilowatt hour battery and yeah. I'm full, yeah. only 10% to keep me over going Correct. during the night. Yeah. And then you still have plenty to go back to work in the morning. Mm. This is the thing. Mm. You, you know, people talk about, oh, well, what happens if I don't, you know, have enough energy for the next day? Most people aren't driving hundreds of kilometers every day, right? They're driving to and from work or to mm. and from school. You know, maybe they're using 10, 15 kilowatt hours out of their car battery. The rest of it's just sitting there wasted, right? Mm. So mm. you can use some of that excess uh, in your home and then 
you know, drive to work the next day, plug in, plug into a public charger and top it back up to full again. Right. Right. So, right. so Solar Hub basically supplies quite a number of services. Just let's play the yes and no game. Mm. You do solar? Yes. Batteries? Yes. Heat pumps yes. for hot water? Yeah. Heat pumps for air con, so basically air conditioning systems? Correct. You do even do induction cooktops? We do, yes. Anything I forgot? Uh, EV charges um, <laughs> is the other thing. Um, but they're the, they're the primary services that, that we provide for, for homeowners. Um, we do provide um, support and maintenance as well. You know, these, these things need regular cleaning. You look at air conditions, they need filters changing. Um, solar systems don't need a huge amount of maintenance, but, you know, every few years it's good to get someone to come out and check it, uh, make sure it's performing optimally, um, possibly clean the panels every few, few years as well. So we provide a support and maintenance function as well within our business. Um, and, and that's across all of those product lines. So one of the big differences I think about Solar Hub is that we do not only sell you the system, but we're there to support you, you know, through the life of that system too, right. um, with our own technicians. So if it would be a windscreen wiper, you're not just wiping this bit, you're really, Solar Hub is an energy hub. Correct. Yeah, and Dan, maybe I should have used a better name when I first started it rather than calling it Solar Hub. I should have called it Energy Hub. But ultimately, Marcus, none of this electrification thing works without solar. That's the key thing. You know, you need solar as the generator. Otherwise, where are we getting our energy from, mm, right? So mm, mm. Um, solar, allow, it allows us the privilege of, of turning all these things on um, when we want, you know, for, for free. And I mean... Most people don't realise, but in Australia we're very lucky with the sun hours we have. Yeah. Uh, we probably do triple what Europe gets out of their same sky. So yeah. Australian solar is very strong and creates a lot of energy. It is, and um, in most places of the country. I mean, even down in Tasmania, they've mm. still got um, better solar radiance than you know most of Northern Europe. So mm. Mm. pretty well everywhere in, in Australia, there's an ab abundance of solar. Uh, pretty good weather for the most part. You know, yes, we have some storms and some cloudy days like anywhere, but you know most of the year round in solar, you've got good solar generating weather. Um, so yes, all rooftops, in my opinion, in the, in the country should be covered with solar. That's something we should certainly be trying to achieve. Um, mm -hmm. And everyone should have a battery too. You know, that's where we're headed is that everyone should be able to generate their own power, store that power and, 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 and be independent from the grid as much as possible. I mean, what I don't get with the Australian government, they're spending the big bucks at the moment with all those solar farms and then they need these big transmission lines to bring it into the cities. Mm. Why aren't they trying to really make all the roofs of the city a big solar farm? Not sure of the answer to that question. I think it's a tricky one. I mean, obviously, we, we probably need both, right? So you think about big businesses and factories with really high energy demand, you know, there's probably not enough roof space um, for them to, to become energy independent. Um, so you are going to always need in this new renewable world, you're going to need large-scale solar farms, wind farms onshore and offshore. You're going to need hydro. You need all these bigger things to supplement the roof. It can't all be done, unfortunately, with rooftop solar. So you're going to need a mix. Um, the big benefit, though, at least for the average Joe in, in their own home, is that for the most part, they can become pretty independent and they mm. can get their bills down, right, by just putting in solar on their own roof and electrifying the home. That's something that every individual person can take responsibility for. You know, we can't all be responsible for the big business at the end of town. That's, that, that's got to be worried about by governments and the big network mm. operators. But we need a combination. We need to be tackling all of these things. We can't just look at one single, you know, um, renewable solution. We've got to be looking at a raft of things, big storage. But people big can wind. basically take responsibility for their own Correct. home, their own life mm. and their own electricity bills. Correct. And, and, and have some significant savings, you know, and, and it's a cost-effective thing to do. Most return on investments for solar these days, you know, are somewhere around about that four to five-year mark, you know, um, with batteries, maybe it extends it out to sort of six or seven. Um, you start doing full home electrification, it's sort of around that seven to eight mark at the moment. But these paybacks are mostly within the warranty periods. It's a pretty good investment, you know, you think about either putting the money in the bank and earning interest or, or putting into this, the better investment is to electrify your home and put solar on your roof. Mm. So, I mean, I do still see on Facebook and other places some critical people going, nah, solar doesn't make me any money. Mm. Does it make you money? Of course it does. You know, um, it saves you money, at the very, which is 
basically making you money, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than having to pay a retailer. Um, Do the sums for me. How does it make sense? Well, I mean, you're paying upwards of 60 cents a kilowatt hour sometimes in, in peak rates these days. Mm. Um, and shoulders sort of 20 to 30 cents off peak somewhere around about that 20, 20, 25 cents uh, a mark now. That's money you're paying a retailer. You've got no control over it. They keep up in the rates. You've got to pay more, right? And what a solar system does is prevent you from having to buy that, right? And that's where the saving is. You're generating that energy, you're using it in the home, potentially storing it in a battery, and then you're not having to pay a retailer for that energy. That's where the saving is, right? And it's significant, right? You, depending on how much you, you, you spend on a solar system, seven, eight grand, something around that mark, you're generating energy for the next 25 years <laughs> at a very reduced rate. So if you think about that investment over that lifetime, you can be paying somewhere around four to five cents a kilowatt hour in reality um, for that energy. So um, the savings are not paying. <laughs> That's the key thing. It's not paying the retailer, not paying the network operator, generating that power yourself. That's where the, that's where the saving is. But uh, would you say then what? A normal solar system gives you $300 a year or is it two and a half thousand? Which one? Oh, it, it is really dependent, this one. I'm, I'm, I'm cautious of giving a single answer, but it depends on the Let's size say four of your people, house. average yeah. house, average billing. Um, I mean, I've got the experience myself. I'm saving about <laughs> two and a half grand, but yeah. is that about normal? Um, that's probably a little bit on the higher side. I think certainly the average would be somewhere around about that $800 to $1,500 mark would be the average savings you, you could expect. It differs depending on where you are in the country. Canberra actually has slightly lower energy prices, although they've just gone up considerably I know recently. the Canberrians <laughs> really feel that we're being ripped off and we're paying too much, but I trust you in other yeah. parts of Australia, it's Canberra prices higher. look very um, beautiful. They do. And um, I mean, they've got a bit of a rude shock recently because they've gone up a lot and, mm. and New South Wales didn't increase as much. And arguably, Canberra's prices will possibly catch up to the rest of the market at some point. You mm. Know? Mm. Um, mm. But in New South Wales, for example, you know, we've got customers that are paying you know, 60 cents a kilowatt hour. You know? in, in, in peak times. In peak times. Yeah. I mean, five years ago, that might have been 30 or 40 cents a kilowatt. It sort of doubled in that period. Look, um, it's not going to be an, uh, an energy retailer bashing program here, mm. but I found it very interesting when the Ukraine war started and everybody was going, oh, my God, energy's gone up and we paid 30% more in on the 1st of July two years ago for electricity. Mm. Now the wholesale has come back mostly back to the old level mm. and they gave us 1% off the next July. So what happened to that 29% in between? That's all in profit, <laughs> is it? I think a lot of it would be profit. Um, I think some of it's being reinvested in the network as well. I mean, they're having to, you know, where the governments are pushing them to, to increase their investments in the network. But I think, yes, it's a combination of profit. Equally, their costs have gone up too. You know, everyone's costs have gone up in business. So, you know, the cost of maintaining the lines, labour costs, all these <laughs> things have increased as well. So, um, yes, those, those savings have probably been banked in profit. Some of it's been spent on the infrastructure, some of it on their operating costs. But yes, I think for the most part, they're probably making a bit more money than they used to. But if you go solar, you can avoid basically all those cost increases Correct. because you, you, you will, you'll, your bill will still go up a little bit too because mm. you're still getting some from the grid. Yeah. But your dependency and the amount that's going up is going mm. to be significantly reduced. Well, if, I mean, it, it, it's pretty easy maths. If you've got a you know $4,000 a year bill and it goes up by 20%, then that's $800, right? Mm, but mm. if you've brought that bill down to $1,000 a year, let's say, and you increase by 20%, then that's only $200. <laughs> that's pretty easy maths, you know. You, you, you're shielded from those price increases by mm. reducing the amount of energy you need from the grid. And those percentages just don't hurt you much. In dollar terms, they don't hurt you as much. Right, right. I hear that you guys qualified for a very special rebate in New South Wales, which mm. makes a purchase from Solar Hub much cheaper there are many others when it comes to batteries. Mm. Can you explain? Uh, so I've been very progressive with batteries. We installed some of the first power walls, for example, power wall ones in the country in ACT. Um, and we took uh, that experience um, to the New South Wales government as part of a thing called their Emerging Energy Program. 
right, which was, um, I guess, a tender process that went out about four years ago um, that looked for companies to provide solutions for both grid scale storage and um, distributed storage. So we pitched a project to them that said, we want to um, reduce the upfront costs um, of batteries for consumers. Um, we want to offer a $4,950 rebate um, and we would like you guys to subsidize this project. So um, hang on, hang on. Nearly $5,000 rebate for homeowners in New South Wales on the South Coast? Correct. But only available through Solar Hub? Correct. Yeah. So it's a, it, it was a tender process and it's something that um, we're building exclusively yeah, wow. in that part of the world. So that's, a, that's a third of the battery cost, literally. It is. Yeah. No, it's a substantial amount um, off, off the power wall. Um, you need to uh, commit to being part of the VPP um, for, to access that, but the VPP but provides you additional benefits. Just for anybody, VPP is virtual power <laughs> plant, which means that the energy retailers at certain times when they grid is tight for energy is allowed to access your battery should there be additional power available. But then you also got some benefits out of the VPP. You do. So you get a, um, a supply charge discount. So your supply charge is, is waived for that first 12 months. Mm. And you also get a higher feed-in tariff. So it's actually a 15 cent feed-in tariff. And that applies not just to your battery exports, to your solar exports too. Um, so both those two things combined deliver, you know, somewhere around about 500 to $600 in benefit um, to you as the consumer for being part of that, yeah, yeah, being part of that VPP. Can you get it in Sydney? Uh, no, no, we um, we actually don't unfortunately. Operate I want to in get Sydney. one for my own place. <laughs> <laughs> no, we only um, the regions. It's, it's pretty well everywhere south of Sydney. So we deal with anywhere from Wollongong all the way down to the Victorian border, Eden, into sort of the Canberra and the Snowy regional right, area, right, right. Um, and and Goulburn as well. So sort of draw a line around that. That's that's our operating area, and that's where the VPP is being built. And part of it was obviously. Um, in response to the sort of disastrous fires that the South Coast community had down there. And, you know, I personally was um, was there there when um, those fires were on and, you know, our house didn't have any, any power, you know, for a whole week. And so it's not just about, um, you know, moving your energy around and saving your bills, but also having backup protection as mm -hmm. well, you mm -hmm. know, in the event that the grid... Um, goes down for days or weeks at a time that you've got um, a battery there um, uh, to provide backup protection. So there are some other benefits people don't talk about as much. It's not all about ROI and bill savings. It's about the fact that I was the only bloke in the street with the, you know, with with the lights on and and the fridge on. You know, mm. so it's um, uh, yeah, that's that's sort of how it, we it adds it. to the comfort of the home, of course, because if the grid is down and you've got a decent sized battery and you're not starting to bake electric cakes every five minutes, then theoretically, during the day, your battery can be filled up, you use it again <laughs> at night, and you theoretically, as long as you're not getting 10 days of rainy weather, yeah. you will be actually able to live off the grid. All these bushfires generally happen in summer, don't they? Mm, you know, mm. and um, when you've got pretty good solar conditions. Yes, um, yes. So yeah, a battery will definitely get you through the night time. You do have to be a bit more conservative. You know, if mm. if you're in backup uh, mode, as you say, you don't want to be baking cakes, but certainly powering your fridge, your lights, your Wi-Fi, even all of these things can stay on. You still got most most of your creature comforts. Um, what about the PlayStation for the kids? One hundred percent. They actually don't use much power. You know, but yes, yeah, certainly. You know, Cooking, sort of maybe maybe a spa or a pool, you might want to turn those things off, you mm -hmm. know. But the, the, the life's essentials; those devices can stay on. And if you decided to go for two or three power walls, yeah. Oh yeah, you could go a lot longer and, and possibly completely self sufficient. You could have the aircon running as well. So, yeah, mm -hmm. certainly if you've got multiple power walls, you could um, have a party. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> have invite all your friends. Over. All neighbours are really bored. Yeah, you're, well, there was you're the much only going bloke on. with light. Like, yeah, and the fridge full of beer. Yeah. They'll, they'll attract them all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they bring that warm beer to bring it and cool it down. Yeah. Well, you're the pop most popular bloke on the street if you're the only one with cold beer, surely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, um, you've been going for how many years? You said 14? 14, yeah. So do you now get repeat customers who actually had a system 14 years ago and oh, looking at replacement? A repeat customers is, um, I think, about half Solar Hub's business. I mean, we have people coming back all the time for new things. And now that we also do um, air conditioning and, and hot water, induction cooktops and these other products where people – hear that we do that now and, and, and they decide to use use us for those products because they had such a good experience um, with us on, on the solar or, or the battery system. So absolutely, a good business um, 
is, is, is built off its repeat customers, you know, and if you don't have these those repeat customers and you're definitely doing something wrong. Um, so, yeah, we focus on providing a great experience um, and then, yeah, people come back when they, they want to do the next thing. There's people coming back and upgrading their solar now, you know, mm-hmm. systems that we put in over 10 years ago, um, a lot of them are still working quite well, but, they're, you know, they're a two or a three kilowatt system and um, customers now want a, want a few more panels, so we stick on another five or another 10 and, and, and scale it up for customers. Mm. But in a lot of cases, those small solar systems, the rules have changed. Mm. You can't actually bolt extra to it. You really need a separate system next yeah. to it sometimes, is it? Correct. So, yeah, you're usually putting in an additional inverter and additional panels. A lot of these old systems... Um, they just work, you know. It, it's ironic because, you know, back then solar was a, a bit more simple. You know, the inverters didn't do a lot. Some of them don't even have a screen on them, you know, but they did just work, you know. Mm. We did a lot of um, a lot of SMA back then, which is really good German German tech, mm. you know, mm. and, and those systems just haven't missed a beat, you know. Mm. So, uh, yes, we usually just leave those alone um, and, then, and then put on a new one on another different roof space or mm. different mm. roof angle and, mm. and go again. Now, let's say I'm a customer who had a one and a half kilowatt system, mm. but I went for the cheapy DP mm. and you get there and you find actually somebody plonked it right in the middle of the roof <laughs> in the best possible spot. Mm. And now building little panels around it would look really silly. Mm. Do you yeah. sometimes have to replace? We do quite a lot, unfortunately. And, and look, if those cheapy cheap systems have lasted 10 years, I'll eat my hat. I mean, they don't generally last that long. They've Generally, if we get to a system like that, um, it's been dead for a few years. Hasn't correct, it? and you know, a customer maybe hasn't noticed, or someone new has moved into the home and and didn't realise that system was off, and thought they were buying a, a, a house with a solar system on it. But the reality is that solar system had died years ago. So there is a, it, it's definitely important to buy quality, I think, up front. Mm. Um, but yes, we we take those systems off, and we do recycle. Um, most of those materials, there's um, uh, companies that, that will take the inverters off us and, bra- and, bra- and break them down and take the, mm. the high value materials out of them. There's solar panel recyclers now as well. Mm. And for the most part, those solar panels can be recycled. Um, and then we, then we put a new one on. So, but, you know, as I said to you, yes, there's cheaper systems where we have to go and replace them. There's plenty of smaller, older systems that are still working really, really well. And we just don't touch them. You know, mm. we just leave them. Mm. Let them run another 10 years. Right, know. right. Let's say, I mean, there's solar panels that have a slightly higher quality. There's inverters that have more functionality, hybrid inverters. So you can get different cost factors in the gear that you supply. Mm. If I get the best possible brands, can it still be stuffed up? Of course it can. For me, the gear these days, it, look, it's important and there are – Certainly cheaper options that I wouldn't advise customers to go with. Um, and there's the, obviously the ones that we suggest um, that customers um, go with that we're happy with and we're, you know, are reliable and, and, and we think um, are, are good products to offer. But the installation is is really important too and it, it gets overlooked. And I, and I know this is a hard thing for, for customers to go, well, am I, am I getting a good installation off this company? Oh, it's, you just, know? A, it's just a cable running along yeah. the wall uh, well, on the outside. I can see it. Yeah, a lot of – unfortunately, that's where I think a lot of the quality issues come. It's certainly where a lot of the longevity issues come, poor connections, you know, that lead to devices failing um, within the system. So, What about – I save a bit of money on the cable and give you a thinner cable. Yeah, that can happen too. You know, or I can just run everything external down your, you know, beautiful new wall or, and on a new house you've got and I've got ugly conduit running down the side. What's yeah. wrong with orange? Yeah, that looks ugly in my opinion. <laughs> but, you know, a good installer will tuck those things away where they can and, and um, yeah, upgrade the cable, you know, to make sure that you're not getting any sort of voltage losses or drops. Um, so, yes, it's the installer's – for me, more important often than the gear. <laughs> I know this sounds counterintuitive, but getting a good installer that's been around for a while, that knows all, the, has made all the mistakes, I guess you could say, is is more important for me than probably what, what gear you pick. Yeah. And that's the kind of guy you guys employ? Of course we do. Yeah. I mean, we um, are very picky about who we work with. We have a mixture of our own installers on staff. We do use some contractors too, but those contractors have often worked for us or we've been working with them for a really long time and they may as well be part of our staff. Unfortunately, with um, 
you know, with the good, the good installers, the ones that we've sort of trained up through their apprenticeship, a lot of them actually want to move on and do their own thing, you know, but we generally, they, they stay part of the solar hub family, you know, and we keep working with them even when they've sort of got their own little business that's set up. So we like to think that, um, we train our installers to be the best installers in the industry and we hope they stay, but sometimes they do move on to other, um, to their own business. And we're happy to engage with those, those businesses because we know exactly what they've like. We trained them. So, you know, we, we, really happy to work with them. Do you think you can say with confidence that Solar Hub is the most experienced battery installation company in the ACT? Oh, absolutely within the ACT. I, you know, question is possibly a question is whether we're the most experienced in the country. We've done a lot of batteries. I would by no means say we've done the most. There's probably plenty of companies that have done more, but we've been doing it now for about eight or nine years. So it's a decent amount of time. Um, and we would have several thousand battery installations out there already. So yes, we've um, experienced all the the joys <laughs> of going through as an early adopter into that space. And I think now our installers um, are really experienced and knowledgeable on batteries. And um, yeah, Solar Hub would certainly be the biggest in the ACT. Yeah. Right, right. Now, how do you ensure the quality of the gear that you pick? So Solar Hub uh, has some really uh, stringent processes for bringing new products into our business. We actually have a little lab um, that's out the back of our warehouse that's got a whole bunch of inverters on it. We've got a whole bunch of panels on the roof. Um, but we generally put things through their paces before we release them to the market. So the first thing you've got to do is make sure that you've got a really good filter at the front, that you don't let poor quality products into your range. That's the first thing you can do. The second thing is obviously a great installation. Right? So getting experienced tradespeople to install these products with care uh, is the next most important thing you can do to ensure quality. And probably the third thing uh, I think is having a really good inspection regime. So we don't just rely on you know the clean energy regulator inspectors or the local electrical inspectors to inspect our systems. We actually um, have an inspection, internal inspection regime. So we go out and handpick a uh, a portion of the installs that we do and we go and look over them. We get an independent person to go over and make sure that it's meeting all the standards, meeting our best practice guidelines. Um, we think that's a really important part and something that does differentiate us from most um, of our competition and that we have internal auditing processes. And have you found sometimes corners work hard? Yeah, we do. And we fix them. You know, I mean, yes, from time to time, either, you know, someone's stressed that day or dropped the ball or, yeah, of course we pick up mistakes, but we fix them, you know, and that's, um, no one's perfect. You know, it's about what you do when you find those errors. And if we see those errors and it's a particular install of them, we go back and do even more of an audit and make sure that we resolve those problems. So yes, we do find problems from time to time, but we fix them. We engage with the customer, make sure that that solution is brought up to standard. So we'd be naive to think that we are completely perfect. Mm. We we're very, very good, but we make sure we find the bits where we're not good and we improve and we're constantly looking and improving. Um, the other aspect I think that's uh, important to note about solar is we take safety really, really seriously too. You know, this is something that does concern me. I, I drive around every day and I, I see, you know, in young 18-year-old installers on roofs, no harnesses, no ropes, you know, no no safety, you know. Carrying this huge yep. panel yep. in the middle in of a winds. windstorm, yeah. a bit of wet on the tile. And, and I shudder because, you know, I know and have heard of, you know, those young people dying doing these things and, um, you know, it, 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 it does worry me and, it, and, it, and it's something that really grates me when I see it, you know. we. But you save some money. Sure. The you know. installation company can give you a $300 cheaper system mm. because he didn't bother with the harness, yeah. he, didn't bother, bother, um, he didn't bother with uh, edge protection mm. um, and I think those people are normally called roof monkeys. Yeah, well, or cowboys, you know. I think it... Those are the things that I hate to see. It's a bit of a blight in our industry. I think it's um, something that um, happens way too often. And as I said, we've seen people fall through skylights and fall off roofs and all these things that are quite tragic stories. And I certainly don't you know, want that to happen to any of our guys. Um, I mean, even as a homeowner, do you really not want to look at that solar system and think a young bloke you know, fell off and broke his leg and all that because the company tried to cut a couple of corners? So what do you do for safety? 
Well, we, we have edge protection as a mandatory part of our business. So it doesn't happen on every site because not all sites can have edge protection, but I think 80, 90% of the time we're using edge protection um, around the roost. Now that takes a bit more time to set up and pack down, um, but it, for me, um, you, it's the best engineering control that you will have is having a, a, a protective so barrier So it's basically around a the fence roof. around the roof. Correct. So if you happen to roll somewhere and slip, yep. there's actually a, right on the edge something that you can hold on to Correct. like a rail. Yeah. And that makes the difference between you falling down or not. Yeah. yeah. And sometimes you know, you're up on a double story building. It's not just a, you know, a two meter fall you're mm. potentially exposed to. It's a four or five meter fall. You know, and a four or five meter fall you land on a concrete. It's it's going to end pretty badly for you. But mm. just coming back to your original point about you know yes you know these some people cut corners on safety. Generally, that goes hand in hand with cutting corners on quality, I find, is that the people that are cutting corners on safety maybe saved you $300 because they've not set up a proper safety system. Generally, those installers are also cutting corners with what they're doing with your installation too, you know. So those things go, safety and quality go absolutely hand in hand. The good installers, the good operators take both of those things seriously. And for the end customer to kind of make it clear how do you can cut corners, there are uh, steel cable ties, for example, which will last 10, 20 years, mm. or there are plastic cable ties, which in our UV will die after two years. Yeah. They end up in your gutter, your gutter gets blocked, you then wonder why you're getting water into your house. So those are the little things mm. where people can cut a corner. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't notice on the day of the install, but three, four, five years later, you will notice it. Yeah, is that what's happening? Definitely. And there's, I mean, I could we whole we could cover a whole session on the things that you could um, do wrong or cut corners on install. There's there's hundreds of things that people do. Um, I like my favorite is always just use silicon. <laughs> yeah, well, nobody bothers too. with a screw. Yeah, silicon I mean that's the thing. You break a tile, you know, and it does happen. You should be replacing it with a new one, particularly if you break it down the middle. But dodgy companies will just put a bit of silicon on it and, and give it another three or that, four years, and that'll become a roof leak. And but I'll put it right in the middle under. <laughs> the solar panel so you will never notice about it. Yeah. I'm really good at this stuff. <laughs> I should tell you all the tricks you can do to do a cheap solar system yeah. and cause the customer a lot of pain later, yeah. but on the day of the install, they'll still make me a cup of tea. Yeah, well, uh, you don't know about it until later. That's the thing. That's the key message. Well, is, but by then, I've, I've actually closed the company. I've done a runner, so yeah. you would never know either. And that, and that happens far too I'm often in, uh, too. I'm in uh, Hawaii mm. having a surf. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, what, what can you do? You can... You over silicon everything. Basically, yeah. you silicon where you could have done it properly. Yeah. What about in the inlet getting into the roof? Don't I just drill through the <laughs> tile and put a bit of silicon? No. Well, I mean, and that's probably been done in the past, but you know, you should be using a proper deck tight um, that's secured and waterproofed. Um, when you're running the cables through the roof space, they should be tied up. You should be using conduit when you're going. Down but in the roof. the roof, there's nobody there. I can just run it along the floor. Who cares? Yeah, until you poke your head in there and a rat's gnawed at it, and the next minute, you know, you get an electric shock. Like that's that's the risk, right? A good installer will take all those things into consideration and think about your safety as well. You know, when you leave you know, the site and customer gets up in the roof space, you know, to I don't know collect some boxes that they put up there and you've got cables running around in the roof space potentially exposed. It's high it's voltage. A safety, it's a safety risk. High yeah. voltage, mate. Yeah. I chew on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's you know those sort of things scare, worry me. So, you know, as I said, a good installer will take that really seriously to make sure that when they leave the systems is as safe as it can be. Yeah. Did you know you can save about 20 bucks or so by using a few less um, – like roof hooks and stuff like that, just a yeah. few less brackets and all that, yeah. you can't notice under the panels. Well, not until you get big winds. And the problem with, um, you know, the array You're really frame, not going for my savings measures, are you? <laughs> no. Um, but, they're pro you know, if you don't uh, follow the standards with respect to your, your feet spacings and the rail and all these things that you use underneath standards, the panels. There are standards, are there? There are standards. Yeah. Um, when you get big winds, you know, generally what will happen is these things will loosen up over time, right, because they're moving too much mm. on the roof. Mm. And, mm. you know, next minute you've got a panel flying off and, you know, hitting the neighbour or a kid. Oh, that's or, a warranty claim. No, no, that's, you know, you're potentially killing someone, you know. So these are things that are all hidden. They're all they're all out of sight, out of mind, you know, until something bad goes wrong. Yeah. You sound to get really quite emotional about this stuff. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a, a bit cynical perhaps. I don't know if I'm emotional, but I'm pretty cynical about it because I know this is a way that, you know, we get – a quote that's, that's, that's same what you compete 500, against. Exactly. It's $500 less and I'm going, yeah, okay, it's less because of these things. I know what where the corners have been cut. Um, unfortunately, the homeowner just doesn't see that. Yeah. Right. So, again, it comes back to, you know, how long have you been installer been around? How long have they been doing it? How much experience do they have? How long mm. have they been in the market? 
ask these questions. Go and look up how long their ABN's been registered. Mm, mm. Make sure they've got an electrical contractor's license. These are things that you can go and check quite easily yourself. Go and do those checks. Most people would you know sign. all these things. I know. Uh, and it's hard to, I guess, get that message and that word out there. But mm. certainly if anyone asks me, uh, you know, why is this cheaper? I generally say, hey, just Look, maybe they've got a great deal at the moment. Maybe they are a good company. I don't know. But just go and satisfy yourself by going through and checking at the very least that they've got an ABN that's been around for more than six months. They've got a contract, this license. They've got some skin in the game. Um, check out their record. Maybe ask to talk to one of their other customers. Look at their Google reviews. Make sure they're legitimate Google reviews. Oh, there are lots first, of fake. But, I mean, if they have know. 300 Google reviews, you already straight away know that they've 200 <laughs> is fake. I yeah. always say go to the lower ranking Correct. ones because they're the real ones. Yeah, look at the one and the two I mean, stars. I mean, not yeah. lower ranking as a company, but when somebody has low and high, yeah. I click the low to see what some unhappy customers said yeah. and more importantly, everybody can stuff up. Yeah. What was the response of the company yeah. to anybody putting a criticism out there? Yeah. Were they ignoring it mm. or they're actually turning it into a learning exercise? Look, we had a one-star review not long ago, dare I say it, but we turned it into a three-star review. And the guy changed his mind because we hadn't got back to him with a quote. I think it might have been in the in the spam fold or something, and he was annoyed because he hadn't received his quote from us. But you know, we got onto it. We saw the review. We rang him, hand delivered it, hand delivered the quote, and you know, as as much as he was still pretty unhappy about his original experience, he updated his you know Google review to a three star, and um, he might even buy a system off us. You know, but it, it again, everyone makes mistakes. Every, not every company's perfect, but it's what you do when you make those mistakes. There's a difference between a really high quality, good company that's mm. you know going to last a distance and one that's going to shut up shop in 12 months and leave you stranded. And uh, I think about 900 companies have done that. Have yeah. you had any like that in Canberra too? Oh, all the time. You know, we I remember when we were really, uh, the, the industry was booming in, in sort of 2012, uh, quite a long time ago now, um, when they had a... Um, a premium feed-in tariff there. Now, when that feed-in tariff ended, most companies packed up and left. Mm. You know, they took their money and ran. And there were probably about 15 companies around in Canberra at that point. Um, out of all those ones, I don't know of anyone other than Solar Hub that's still there. I think they've all gone. Um, and But new ones keep on coming. Of course, you know, and, and some stay, you know, around for a decent amount of time. Some don't. Mm. Um, we also, unfortunately, get a lot of Sydney companies that – you know, pretend that they're local and open up a presence in Canberra and then disappear as soon as there's a warranty issue. So um, buy local is another really important message, you know. Buy off someone that you can walk into their showroom and eyeball them, you know, that have got a bit of skin in the game and a shop front and employing local people, that's also really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Solar Hub, you're in Canberra. Do you kind of put anything back in the community or is it just all about the money? What's your social engagement? <laughs> Oh, we do lots of community initiatives. You know, we've donated systems from time to time. Um, we have uh, sponsorships with a lot of community um, sporting organisations. You, you can ACT name a Netball, few. Um, ACT Netball. Yeah, East Lakes them. Football Club. You know, so we do um, – and right down to a little bit, I think we, we sponsored the, the roller derby down there. I don't know if you know it. I don't, I, it's a bit of a, a fringe sport, but, you know, right down to sort of maybe more obscure sports as, as well that we've sponsored over the years. So we do believe in giving back um, and typically that's through sort of sporting sporting organisations, but we have uh, given away systems as well to some schools on occasion, um, uh, which is also one way that we can, you know, give back to the community. So we're very community focused in Canberra. You've got to, you know, you've got to be. I live in Canberra. I, I work with these people and my kids go to the same school as these people. Wherever we can help, we do. Mark, so uh, you're going to get a lot of people now inquiring about a free <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, I mean, look, we can't give them all away, right? But, you know, where there's a, um, a really good case for it, we do, you know. So, um, or certainly at a substantial discount. Yeah. Okay. You get a free netball game? <laughs> yeah, we go to the netball games. You know, we've um, uh, we we donated a whole bunch of netballs there at one point as well um, to the to, to ACT Netball um, with a Solar Hub logo. Yeah, we it? put our logo on it. Of course, we did. But you know, it's um, mm. yeah, they, it's one thing that we've we've had that uh, that relationship now for about seven years with ACT Netball. Mm -hmm. If you would be an end customer and you think about solar, do I now just buy solar or do I buy solar and a battery? Um, look, I would have to uh, look at your energy bills and, and decide what's most appropriate for you. Um, I would think now I would be telling people to buy solar and battery. 
I, I think it's gotten to that stage now with batteries where the cost has come in far enough. The power prices have gone up obviously considerably too. The feed-in tariffs have gone down um, and that's where a battery really comes into its own. It's when you can offset that peak time, which is you know, generally when it's dark, when you get home from work, that's when the power is the most expensive and that's when a battery provides you with the most benefit. So I would say for most people, definitely consider um, going solar, you know, with a battery. Look at hot water too. That's the other big thing. You know, if you're um, still using, you know, gas, consider getting a heat pump would be the other big suggestions that I would look at. How much is hot water in the energy footprint of a house? Uh, look, it can be upwards of 30, 40%. Of uh, my for total energy just total goes energy into hot water. Yeah. Wow. You know, it depends on how long you have showers. You know, some, some, <laughs> some households it's more. Um, typically we find with younger kids, you know, they're mm. running baths and having longer showers and those sort of things. Teenagers. Kids. Yeah, teenagers as well. They generally have higher um, uh, impact from hot water systems. Mm -hmm. So definitely hot water is one good way. And then, look, hot water acts as a bit of a battery as well. This is, you know, a bit of roundabout. But if if it's heating the water during the daytime and you've got solar on your roof, then effectively that solar is, you know, going into your, your hot water tank, isn't it? Yeah, so your hot direct. water tank becomes the uh, poor man's battery. Correct. It? Yeah, and it's a very cheap option. I mean, mm. you can get a heat pump for, you know, four or five grand, you mm. know, as an mm. entry level option mm. up to about seven for something more expensive. Mm. So mm. it's, you know, it's half the price, less than half the price of a battery. I mean, I always find it strange when you look at batteries and other things, people always bring the return of investment. Mm. But when they buy a couch, they never look at the return of investment. <laughs> Correct. So, yeah. I mean, isn't a, a battery also adding to the comfort level of your home and uh, you're de-risking future electricity price rises, mm. you're de-risking in case of a blackout, yeah. you're adding value to your house. So these are all pros for a battery nowadays. Of course. I mean, the economics, just to be clear, the ROI probably stacks up. Um, mm. for a battery already. But yes, there are some other benefits and backup's the obvious one. Mm. I mean, not, you, you have a grid outage and, uh, and you've There's got your There's $300 worth of groceries uh, correct. Uh, that are just you've, wasting now. Your, your freezer, everything melts in mm. your freezer. It can be more than $300. You know, some people mm. have got big chest freezers with probably thousands of dollars of meat and fish and all these things mm. in there that mm. they've frozen. Mm. You can lose a lot if you have a blackout. So mm. yes, batteries aren't just about ROI, right? Mm. There's mm. that sense of independence, which I think is, you know, really altruistic sort of thing for customers to um, to think about. You know, I'm, I'm I'm standing on my own two feet here. You know, that's a, a, mm. a great thing to feel. Um, I mean, to say bluntly, I think a lot of people don't like their energy retailer and if they can actually give them the middle finger, yeah. that is a very nice feeling. Well, I think it was a, it was a choice or it was one of the, one of the um, uh, independent rating agencies that said, uh, that retailers were the least trusted brand in the country. I think it's worse than banks. <laughs> so, you know, it's they're definitely a bit on the nose. Um, because every time they have an opportunity to screw you and put the prices up because you've got no choices, yeah. and then they say, oh, you know, ring around, they all have the same price. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, it, it's marginal, isn't it, the yeah. discount you get. And often the discounts are just to keep you and then six months it goes back to the way it was. Yeah, you know? and then if you've been loyal to them for five years, you actually pay more <laughs> than the one that is coming new. The, yeah. This is what really gets me pissed oh. off. So that's why I go on solar and battery because yeah. I really want to be able to have as little to do with my energy retailers. Mm. I just don't like them. Look, get solar and battery, but also shop around. This is the thing that amazes me. Get on the phone. Get on one of those comparison websites. Move. For the, for the electricity. For the electricity. If you're mm. not happy or, you know, you're paying too mm. much, move. Don't be wedded to one particular retailer just because you've been with them the last 15 mm. years. They're not loyal to you, so why are you loyal to them? You know, ultimately, you're just buying a commodity. Electricity is just electrons flying from some point in a, in a generator to you, mm. right? Mm. Anyone can sell you these things. So but get the best deal. Can Search Solar Hub actually, deal. let's say I buy solar from you mm. and a battery, can you advise me which are actually the more competitive companies in your region? We do and 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 we recommend some plans that we know are good and retailers that we know are good in our region. Um, but ultimately, you've got to make that move yourself. We can't um, move you. <laughs> you've got to go and... Uh, instigate that, that process yourself, mm. obviously due to mm. privacy concerns. Mm. So yes, we do make some recommendations where we think there's really good value. That VPP offer that I talked about is, um, with Actuage Yellow, it's a really good deal. Um, but you know, if if you're not happy with the deal that you're currently getting and you think you're getting ripped off, move. You know, ring around some of these retailers, ring your current retailer and see if you can get on a better plan. Nearly always they'll find something cheaper for you to keep you. They want to keep you. Or if you're threatened to go and want a better plan. Correct. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's funny. I, I, um, 
uh, someone we work with uh, moved retailers last week and then the old retailer rang up and all of a sudden he's got this amazing deal and he moves, moved back straight away, you know, because he got this other deal. So whatever, as I said, don't, you know, shop around, you know, and, and don't be afraid to leave because when you leave, that's probably when you get the best deal. Mm. Bit like a relationship. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Not allowed to comment on that. <laughs> no comment. <laughs> um, the old systems, the you know the one and a half kilowatt solar system, six panels, one seventy five, and now what we've got, which is a whole energy solution infrastructure, has it changed a lot? Yes, it has dramatically. I mean, the old systems were really simple things. And, and don't get me wrong, I like the old days, you know, from a retail and store perspective, they were pretty simple things to put in. And, you know, you basically plug in the solar panels, plug the grid in, walk away, right? It was much easier to commission. I mean, you didn't even connect them to the internet back then, right? No monitoring. You know, no monitoring, you know, you just plug in. And, and that said, that's probably why they're still working. You know, a lot of them were just set and forget. Mm. These days, everyone wants to connect to the internet, everyone wants to see what it's doing. You know, they want to see it right down to panel level as to what each panel's doing. They want to control their heat pump and they, you know, want to talk to it through Amazon Alexa and have it on their phone. And, you know, so there's all these, um, you know, they've, be they've become computers, right? You know, it's not just about converting DC to AC anymore. It's, um, they've got computer chips in them and they're actually doing a whole bunch of data processing as well. Um, so yes, it's gotten more complicated from an inst installation point of view, uh, but also gotten a little bit harder from a support point of view because, you know, we've got a couple of people that just sort of sit on the phones and help people reconnect their inverters to the internet, for example. You know, this thing, this mm. thing can happen. The Wi-Fi can drop out. Mm. You know? mm. So yes, they have got more complicated. And in response to that, we've ensured that we've resourced our business in the right way to support customers because um, it's no longer just, as I said, set and forget, walk away. There's now all sorts of things going on with that system from a monitoring point of view, from a control point of view. And we've got people answering phones, answering emails um, uh, to help customers um, when things do go wrong. So if you're with Solar Hub, you do get after-sales support? You do. Yeah, we've got... Um, only two, but we've got two dedicated people that answer phones and we've actually got a dedicated team. Um, we've got four um, uh, tradespeople, two, three electricians and, and one apprentice that all they do is support and maintenance. We, we take responsibility for that and we really pride ourselves on being able to help customers and answer the phone and respond and get out to help. I mean, there's actually a, if, if you call us after hours, we've got a 24-7 phone line. There's always someone there to answer your call. Wow. You know, so if you've got an emergency or, you know, or a question, we're there to answer it. So um, even, I think I've even been called on Christmas Day before, you know. Um, so it's, it's yeah, that's something that we, differentiates us from the rest is the fact that we have that support and maintenance function in our business. Your phone doesn't ring out. Beep, no, it doesn't. Beep, we answer. Beep, yeah. Beep. I mean, we've got, we would have, uh, oh, over over ten thousand systems out there now. I think it's getting close to fifteen thousand wow. systems now. So there's a lot of customers that we've got to support, um, and sometimes it's nothing that went wrong. It's just oh, you know, I, and then it finds out that someone someone switched the modem off in the house, for example. We just have to switch it back on and, and it mm. reconnects. So sometimes it's actually a really simple fix, but mm. you've got to have someone there on the other end of the phone to help mm. you through it. <laughs> I've been in this industry now for close to twenty years. Yeah, a cheap system inevitably is dying in the mm. backside within three to four years. Yeah. Or the whole installation is a total nightmare. So let me mm. tell you one story. My lovely brother-in-law is a bargain hunter. For two years, he's been looking at solar. Every time he sends me a really cheap solar quote system, I check the company out. They're usually gone for three months. Six months later, they're gone again. So I always stand in front of like a truck and say, don't do it. Not with this company. Don't mm. go for the bargain. Pay the proper price. Get the right company. Mm. I turned away. I was on holidays. He got his solar system. Mm. At my son's Christmas party, uh, birthday party, he's sitting next to me and telling me about his $7,000 roof repair he now needs because five monkeys crawled over his roof and broke 28 tiles, took the ridge caps off, and the roof was actually so brittle, the tiles, that side of the roof, they should have never installed it can't find the company, gone. And I was sitting there inside of me seething and going, you bloody idiot. Yeah. I've been telling you for two years this is what's going to happen and you still got stuck by the bargain mm. and now you're paying the price. Mm. His whole roof 
all the water damage, that's additional, mm. the mould, all of this, and he's got a huge stress now. Mm. He could mm. have avoided all of that. Mm. Have you had stories like that? Oh, all the time, Marcus. Yeah, I mean, it It. Um, it happens, as I said, in a large proportion of, of instances when people buy a cheap system, something does go wrong. All the way down to, as you say, water damage, um, mould in your home um, because water got through from the roof. So, yes, it happens a lot. It happens far too much. And the thing that probably makes me most angry is the fact that these companies get away with it. They continue to get away with it. That's probably the, the biggest frustration. It's been going for 10 years, isn't it? Of course. Because yeah. Australians are gamblers. Yeah, we are. They like to see a nice 2999 and they think they can get $40,000 return on that. Mm. Yeah. What, you, yeah, you're going to get the return. Rega- the, the point is with the return, it, it's only as good as the life of the system. You know, if, if yes, you might have paid a little bit less now, but if the system lasts you 20, 25 years – versus a cheaper system like ask you five, well, you know, your payback's significantly better going for Paying the, in a, yeah, the yeah. system that lasts you the distance, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It might be good for a few years, but when it goes wrong, you're going to absolutely... You pull it out. Yeah, exactly. So but, you're but, starting but, again. So you're going to buy twice. You know, that's the... But what I don't get it, between sometimes one quote and another, it might be only a $1,000 difference. That's like less than six months of waiting... Mm for your electricity bill savings. Yeah. So sometimes for that little difference, you're willing actually to compromise the long-term outcome. Yeah. I don't get it. No, I don't. And and, and it comes back to what I think I said earlier was you've got to focus on the installer. It's not so much about the product. Mm. It's much about the price. Find someone reputable. Find someone local. Find someone that's been around for, I would say, at least five years would be the sort of benchmark that mm. I would look at. Mm. That's got proper skin in the game. Um Find someone that's got a support phone that you can ring with technicians there to respond to issues if you've got them. Make sure they're licensed. Find someone with a shop front. It's probably the other thing that I will look at too. You know, if they're just if they're nowhere to be found, and you you know the the, the registered address is, is is some unit block at the top of a commercial building, run away. Right? Kenards Hire, I found one. Yeah, it was a Kenards Hire box. Yeah. So these are red flags. They're not difficult to find if these red flags if you find one of them go somewhere else mm. right mm. so and if you stick to those things and you stick to finding good companies using that methodology then you, for the most part you'll be fine right um, it avoids you dealing with the cowboys doing the simple checks I mean my first advice is always go local of because course. in two years time when you want to upgrade or you need a question there's somebody there yeah the other big thing with buying local is that the, the regulations, the grid connection requirements are all different depending on where you are in the country, mm, right? Mm. And the local companies will understand these things. They'll understand the pitfalls, what you've got to do with export limiting, what the grid approvals look like. You know, often we find uh, when people come maybe down to the south coast of New South Wales, for example, and they've bought off a Sydney mob, is that their system, no one's actually done a certificate of electrical safety no one's told anyone that they're installing the system. They haven't told the network operator. They haven't registered the system. They probably didn't even use qualified tradesperson. So you've got this system on your roof that, yeah, you've got a pretty good deal on. But as far as the network operator is concerned, it's not even there. So guess what they can do? They can come along and they can switch it off. Because right? it doesn't comply. Com- correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And where are you stuck? You're stuck with a system that's tagged out that you can't touch. Absolute dead duck. I mean, you got to drive to Sydney and complain on some kind. Well, that company isn't coming down. They, you know, they sent a team, <laughs> as I said, to do two installs in them once a month, and they drove five hours away. They're not, they're not coming to help you. So that's the difference between using someone out of town and someone local. So understand the local rules. It's their name on the on the line, um, and they're going to follow those local regulations, and that protects you as the consumer. Mm, mm, mm. Okay. Can you explain the solar and battery warranties to me? There's Product, performance, workmanship? Warranty is pretty complicated. I mean, with panels, you're going to have two warranties that really are applicable, although I'd argue it's really only one that's applicable, and that's the product warranty. Mm -hmm. The product warranty um, is the thing that keeps the manufacturer on the hook if something goes wrong with that panel. So let's say it's 25 years. Mm -hmm. That means that in that 25-year period, if something goes wrong from from a manufacturing perspective with that panel, they'll replace it. Now, some retailers will pay not just for the part, they'll also pay for the labor. 
right? Um, but then there's a performance warranty, right? Now that performance warranty um, is different for every different panel out there and there's different ways to measure it, different lines on graphs that you see on the spec sheets. Ultimately, the performance warranty I don't think is worth Much. the paper it's written on. Mm. It says that the panel is going to perform at X, you know, let's say it's 80% at year 25 of what it did in year one, right? And they warrant that. Now, in order to prove, for example, that a panel, you know, is performing at 79%, at year 20, geez, you've got to have a lot of data <laughs> and, and a lot of confidence in the data as well. I mean, I've got to get the panel yeah. off the roof in the first exactly, place. Exactly, to check it. So I, as I said, the, I just wouldn't worry about a performance warranty. There's manufacturers that promise 40-year performance warranties and you see these sort of numbers. You're like, it's just not worth the paper it's written on. Have a look at the product warranty. That's the thing um, that keeps the manufacturer on the hook to replace that panel mm. if there's a fault in that panel and make sure that it's 25 years in in my opinion, that's minimum what you should be looking mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. um, so what about a workmanship warranty? That's the warranty that Solar Hub will give to the end customer. What do yeah. you get for that? So we provide a 10-year workmanship warranty. So that's on um, anything that we do with respect to the installation. So um, as you said, running conduit and cable into the roof space, installing the racking system that we put on the roof. Safety switches? Safety, any switches that we provide. Anything mm. that our tradespeople have done to install that system, mm. we will warrant for 10 years, right? Um, now, batteries are also pretty complicated from a warranty point of view. Most will say it's 10 years, but you've got to read the fine print because some will warrant a certain throughput and by that, I mean how many times you can charge and discharge that battery through that lifetime. Some will have quite a low throughput. Some will have quite a high throughput. Some will say at the end of that 10 years, we're going to warrant 60%. Some will say that we're going to warrant 70%. So hang on. So to read that, the fine print. So it's like it's a 10 kilowatt hour battery. Yeah. Then after 10 years, if it's a 70% warranty, yeah. it'll still hold 7% kilowatt, kilowatt hours, hours because there is a degradation factor there over is. the years, isn't yeah. it? Correct. Right, right, right. And it's the same with panels. Panels, you know, um, degrade as well over time, batteries more so. Mm. Um, and you've got to, be, you know, have a look at the fine print with these things. You really want to see with a battery a minimum of a 10-year warranty and you want to see a minimum of 60%. I would think you'd really want 70% at the end of that 10 years, mm. right? Mm. Mm. At a minimum. And you should be looking for things that are obviously shooting higher than that. Mm. Mm. Throughput's a little bit more of a challenging one to sort of cite numbers now because it depends on whether some manufacturer, if you're connecting it to a VPP or not, as to what throughput they look. But it's an easy way to compare, right? So if you're looking at two different batteries, grab the spec sheets of both batteries, go into the warranty of both batteries, and eyeball it for yourself. Have a look at how long the warranty term is, have a look at the degradation at the end of that warranty period, and have a look at the throughput that they're warranting and compare the two. And often you'll find that one's more expensive for a reason. <laughs> it's because those things are better. Right, right. Um, batteries, have they become more reliable? Yes, definitely. I mean, when we first started installing batteries, we had quite a lot of issues. Um, uh, I'd say now, for example, the, the, the Powerwall 2 that we install, we very rarely have problems with those batteries. Uh, and if we do, Tesla are really quite responsive. Um, same with Enphase. We've been installing some Enphase batteries and some power batteries as well. And we really haven't had widespread issues with those batteries recently. If you go back four, five, six years, yes, when the battery industry was quite new and there were a lot of early adopters around, there were a lot of teething issues. But for the most part now, those things have, have been solved and batteries um, are fairly easy to install and, and, and pretty reliable. And if I would have an issue with my battery, do you send me to the manufacturer or do you going to look after No, me? so Solar, you'd always come back to us in the first instance. You know, we're the ones that answer the phone. We'll help you diagnose it. We've got to make sure that, you know, it's not something that we can fix or something that else has, has gone wrong. And then if, um, if we determine that um, it is a warranty issue, then we will engage with the manufacturer mm. to support customers through that warranty process to get a replacement. Um, and then in most cases, we'll go out and, um, and undertake that replacement ourselves and, and we'll deal with the, the warranty and the paperwork side of it for our customers. There's really nothing customers have to do in that, um, in that situation. If there is a warranty issue, we take care of all of it. Mm. I had a problem with my solar system and I rang the initial installer and they actually palmed me off to the manufacturer mm. and he didn't want to know anything about it. Do mm. you do that too at Solar Hub? No, we don't. Um, 
it's something that we pride ourselves on is, is, is helping you through that because it can be quite a complicated process. I mean, manufacturers, they don't want to have to replace a product, you know, if they don't have to. So they'll give you the runaround, you know, they'll take a while to get back to you. They'll make you fill in forms, make you give them data, all these sort of things. So, you know, it's not in their interest <laughs> to, to, to give you a free replacement, is Especially it? Especially so, when they're in China and I can't speak Chinese. Well, correct. You know, so that's where, you know, a good installer will help you out. They know, they have those relationships with manufacturers. They can help you with the initial diagnostic, gathering whatever data needs to be done, all that initial investigation, and then help you with the claim as well. That's what a good installer will do. And you guys at Solar Hub do that? Of course we do. <laughs> but, but you're not making money on all of that stuff. No, we get a, a very small amount back from the manufacturer, but it doesn't cover our costs, mm. um, which again incentivizes us to sell you a product at the start that's not going to have those problems. You know, as I said, prevention is better than a cure here. So mm. Mm. it does start out with product selection and making sure that the products you put in at the start are high quality, reliable offers that have been well tested before we install mm -hmm. them. So we don't get the warranty issues. Mm -hmm. So what batteries does Solar Hub specifically install and recommend and why? So we've got, mostly we're doing Tesla Powerwalls at the moment. Um, that's our mainstay, but we also uh, recently introduced two other offers. Um, one is from SunPower. It's their SunPower Reserve battery, which is a 10 kilowatt hour uh, battery. Um, uh, and that's good. We've done probably about 40 of those, I think, so far. Um, we've also just started recently um, introducing the Enphase battery as well. So, you know, we've been uh, suppliers of Enphase microinverters for quite a few years now, and it makes sense to um, put uh, their battery in for customers who've already got an Enphase system. Um, so, yes, we do all those, all those three. And they all allow you to do VPPs? They do. Yeah. Mm. Um, look, depending on which option is the, what types of VPPs you can participate in. I mean, all of them are capable of, of um, uh, doing energy arbitrage, that sort of moving mm. your mm. energy around. Um, some are more capable with doing things like frequency control, like the Powerwall 2. Um, but they've got different they've got different features depending on the battery. Mm. Um, but they're all thing all all batteries that we would recommend and, and are comfortable uh, recommending to customers and, and happy to install. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, there's a very trendy term going about lately, which is called the smart home mm. and the H-E-M-S. What is that? So H-E-M-S is home energy management system. Right. right. So it's a term that's getting bandied about a fair bit now um, and it can mean multiple things to multiple people. Ultimately, HEMS is about controlling the energy devices, both consuming and generating, in your home uh, to deliver you uh, value, right? So by that I mean um, if you're generating solar, um, it might make sense to heat your hot water. Um, if you've got excess solar rather than exporting to the grid, direct into the battery. If your battery's full, well, how about we pre-cool or preheat your home? And or use or what about if I have my EV plugged in, Correct. send it off to my battery? Correct, yeah. So a home energy management system will deal with all of those energy flows, but it's not. It's about priority, right? It's about what things you do first. You know, if I've got excess solar, maybe I want to charge my battery first. Maybe I want to put it into my car first. And so a home energy system will generally provide some sort of interface to the customer that allows them to set these rules up and their priorities for themselves. That's what, um, that's what HEMS is all about. Uh, and as I said, there's multiple ways to tackle this. Some of the inverter manufacturers like Enphase and Solar Edge and Fronius there and, and Tesla, they're sort of looking at it from their angle, but you do have some independent um, companies looking at this too. So is it a bit like the VHS and the beater that we get to actually we still work out who's going to win that war? Uh, look, the biggest issue is, uh, and, and this is something that hasn't been solved yet, is is interoperability. It's a big word, um, but that means... Can you say it again? Interoperability. Oh, very good, very good. <laughs> so uh, obviously when you've got different manufacturers involved, you might have one manufacturer making your EV charger, another one that makes your solar inverter, another one that makes you the battery. They all want to do things their way and they don't always play nicely together. All right? So a good HEM solution will take away all that complexity for you right, and allow you to control those devices from one interface. The problem being that a lot of manufacturers don't want to play ball, right? So they want you to stay in their correct, in their eco. It's a bit like the Apple Android thing, you know. Mm. Apple love you being on their iPhone, Apple TV, Apple Mac. You know, they really want you to be in their ecosystem. But someone like Android, 
you know, they don't mind if you play with others. So they're a bit more flexible with who they integrate mm-hmm. with. So you're sort of seeing that battle play out, I think. Um, and um, I don't think there's one that will necessarily win out over the other. I don't think this is a sort of Betamax VHS type battle. I think both will coexist. Some customers want one manufacturer for everything. They want the ease of that. They want the flexibility of that. You're probably going to pay more, right? Others um, want to buy that thing because they like that and this thing of this manufacturer like that and I'll do it more piecemeal. And so they're more like the sort of Android people that are going to get a slightly different experience. So there's a, there's a place for both. Um, uh, but the industry does need to do a bit of work to catch up on the standards. It's it's something that's been worked on by lots of industry organisations at the moment and standards um, organisations. This isn't just an Australia problem, this is an around the world problem to make all these devices play nicely with each other. But listen, I don't want a headache about all that. Can Solar Hub just give me good advice? Yeah, we do. And and where, where we can, we make sure that um, those things integrate and talk nicely to each other. But often we go into homes and they've already got Maybe they've already bought a heat pump off someone else and mm. they've already bought an EV charger off someone else and we're coming in to do, you know, the solar and battery. So it actually gets quite complicated. You know, our um, consultants that go out and do the site visits need a huge amount of knowledge to understand, you know, what we can do in the home, how we can get these things to communicate with each other. Uh, Very I mean, technical. I mean, my advice to people is whoever is initially putting your solar in, mm. pick a good local company because then when all the other bits need to be bolted onto it, mm you got one player who knows what's going on. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you're going to end up with something what I call puzzle pole on mm. solar. Uh, puzzle solar is when four different installers come in and all try to make it work, and that's not always a good experience. No, and it, as you said, it comes back to the company you're buying off. It's not so much about the products here, but about the company that you're buying your system from. Pick someone local. Pick someone that's got some skin in the game. Pick someone that's been around for more than five years because they'll be there to help you with the other things that you want to do in your home. And they'll set you up right from the start. Now, you are called Solar Hub. Mm. You do solars. You do batteries. Why would I let you get anywhere near my AC? (laughs) (laughs) Ah, We have uh, AC technicians on staff. Um, We take pride in that. You know, we're not just selling you an aircon system and getting someone else to, to do all the design work on it. We actually do that ourselves. Um, but it's a natural uh, evolution, I think, for a lot of solar companies to get into these other spaces because these things can't be discrete in their own right. They are, through HEMS, um, increasingly being interconnected. You know, if so, I've got excess solar and well, I'm, I'm getting three cents to export it to the grid, well, why don't I turn my air conditioner on and pre-cool my house so that when I get home, it's nice and cool? Right. Why not use that solar energy, you know, to, to cool my house down or heat my house up in, in the winter? I think in Canberra you possibly right. want to say heat your house up. Yeah, well, certainly. There's yeah, there's both. Um, and so that's that's why we're doing all of these additional things. It's not that we're just slapping an air conditioner system in and, you know, you, you, you get to control the mode. It's that increasingly um, there's linkages between what your solar systems is doing and what other energy consuming devices are doing in your home, like aircon, like heat pumps, like EV chargers, right? So there's a, there's a connectivity between these things. So you're actually saying that if you buy an aircon, it's better to get an energy solutions company because the aircon gets bolted into the rest of it mm. than just a simple aircon company because mm. everything's become a little bit more interconnected and complex. Correct. And when we come out, we have a look at everything. This is the other thing. We're looking at not just the solar but we're looking at air con hot water and we'll tell you what we think the priority is, right? Mm, mm. You know, an air con company comes out, well, they're just going to say, do the air con first. Of course they are, you know, but if someone like Solar Hub comes out and looks at your home, looks at your bills, looks at your energy profile, looks at who's in the house. Would you look at home, my insulation in the roof too? No, we don't actually. That's one thing we don't do, but I always encourage people. It's one of the first things you should do mm. is do insulation. If your house is not adequately insulated, doesn't matter what we do from a heating point of view. It's just gonna. It's like a sieve, right? Mm-hmm. So insulation is something you should definitely do. It, it's not something that we do as a company, but, um, I, mean, but I would, would always you, recommend it. But would you basically, let's say you come out and do an energy audit for me yeah. and you notice that I have no insulation, there's just a chip rock and that's We it. would tell you to put some insulation in. <laughs> and there's a few names that we can give customers if they're mm-hmm. interested, but mm-hmm. you should certainly start with that. But mm-hmm. coming back to the energy, um, energy usage, <laughs> um, and in the home, 
it may be best for you to swap out your hot water initially rather than do aircon. Then do your aircon. Um, if you've already got solar, we may say, oh, maybe don't do a battery yet. We don't think you're the perfect case for it. Maybe you should do your heat pump next and then do your aircon. And then, look, if you've got a bit of money in a few years, then we'll do your battery, right? So it's about setting up a plan for you as the consumer, which is in your best interest. Mm. What are the best uses of your money? You know, not everyone's got enough money to slap at the full home electrification thing up front. It's usually a journey that takes a few years. What mm. things should you do first? What things should you do last? So we help with that prioritization. If I think about solar and batteries, but I don't have the big bucks right now to spend 15, 20 grand, mm. is there an option to maybe pay five grand and do the rest on finance? Look, it depends on where you are in the country um, as to what can be provided. We do have all sorts of financing options. In the ACT, there's um, a thing called the Sustainable Household Scheme. This gives you a $15,000 interest-free loan, um, which can be used to electrify your home. The criteria are a little bit different um, depending on um, whether you're buying solar or whether you're buying a heat pump. It's a bit more stringent on the solar, so um, the, the rules around whether you can access access the funding. But that's certainly the first thing I would look at is generally are there any interest-free sort of government-backed financing programs around. Um, after that, um, there's green loans that you can um, – access through companies like Bright or Plenty that provide um, interest bearing. So they do have an interest rate, but often it's a subsidized interest rate. So it's a little bit lower than the normal interest rates. Mm. And you can use that um, to, to buy products um, for your home. So yes, there's all sorts of options from paying cash up front to government subsidized interest free loans through to interest rate reduced loans, you know, where you're not paying the full whack of interest, you're getting a little bit of a, a subsidy off, off the government. Because solar gives me quite a good return, can it be sometimes if I finance a solar system that actually my repayments would be less than what I would have to pay for the uh, interest payments? Yes, um, particularly if you go for a slightly longer term loan. So if you're looking at some of these loans sort of go out five, seven years, mm -hmm. um, and yes, you can make it cash flow Neutral. Or positive? Or positive, just yeah, a, just little, a little bit. Little. I mean, it, 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 again, it depends on where you are. It depends on your energy bills and your mm. consumption mm. profiles. But mm. yes, you can make it very marginally cash flow positive in some cases. So in terms of the teams that you have that work for Solar Hub, mm. I hire you in. Do I get novices or really experienced guys or guys who are nearly worn out? What's your team like? Oh, it's, it's diverse. And I think that's, that's its strength. You know, we've got um, a bunch of people that have been with the business since the start, right? Um, and we've got others that are new and just starting out their apprenticeship and everyone in between, right? Mm. Um, and I think that creates a really healthy culture um, to have a diverse range of views and experience within the business. Um, we take our company culture really seriously and, and, and are very supportive of each other. So, yeah, we have a whole range of people, a whole range of ages, a whole range of backgrounds, and I think um, I, I think that puts us in good stead, you know. Um, not every solution uh, has the same answer, you know. Having different perspectives and different views mm. in the business is really healthy. But is uh, satisfied staff also makes for a better end customer experience? Of course it does. Yeah, I mean, if you're having a good day and you feel supported by your colleagues and you're having a fun time at work, well, then that is absolutely going to be uh, replicated into your phone manner or how you are when you meet someone on site. So, yes, I, I believe in um, having a healthy, happy culture at work. We actually have a um, uh, a nine-day fortnight at Solar Hub. Um, I know it's maybe a bit progressive, but we um, we still work similar, the same sort of hours. But, yeah, every, um, every fortnight, um, you get a Friday off and people use that to, you know, do their shopping, do their chores, I don't know, spend the day with their kids, pick their kids up from school early or what have you. So it's something that we implemented quite a few years ago now and I think um, people love it. You know, people work really hard when they're there and, and, and we're firm believers in that and sometimes long days but, you know, hey, every second Friday I get the day off um, to go do what I want and I think that really leads to a happy culture. So happy Solar Hub staff means... And customers getting a smile when they walk on the job. Correct. If you're feeling refreshed and, you know, not burnt out and um, you're at your best and, and that absolutely um, replicates into good customer service. Got it. Okay. Um, In-house installers versus contractors. What's your position there? Look, we have both. Um, 
uh, in our organisations. We have both internal um, staff that, that do the installations, but we also use contractors as well. Now, those contractors, I'll just be really clear, they're handpicked, selected. They may as well be part of Solar Hub. We treat them like they are part of Solar Hub. No backpackers? No, no. These are companies that we've had long-term relationships with that we um, – that we, as we treat as part of the broader team. The issue with good installers, uh, when we have um, uh, people do their apprenticeship with us, get all the way through to being qualified, quite often the best tradespeople at some point want to go and do their own thing. You know, So for a company like ours um, that's been growing as much as we have over the last 14 years, we like to maintain a relationship with those installers when they go out um, and potentially run their own companies. And so... Typically, we find ourselves sort of sitting there going, well, hang on a minute, you know, that, that's a really good tradesperson. Maybe we should use him as a contractor rather than bring, bringing someone else on. And so we end up finding ourselves with both internal installers and also external contractors. But a lot of them have been through um, their training with us, so they know how we do things. So if you do go with Solar Hub, you've got somebody that actually knows all your processes, knows how you do the quality control and sticks to the script. Yeah, we don't chop and change. We're not just picking any installer off the street. Um, you're either getting one of our internal teams or you're getting a very trusted contractor. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, when you talk about the solar industry, there are terms called solar shark and solar cowboys and roof monkeys. What are those type of people? Oh, look, they're people that um, don't take uh, customers – uh, need seriously, you know, it, it, it's a very cutthroat industry solar, you know, it's, it's very competitive. Um, uh, the, unfortunately it's very price focused, you know, people, as you say, want a really good deal. And, and what that means when you go with a cheaper deal is generally someone's got to cut a corner to, to make a profit out of that, or even just to break even out of that deal, or they're doing them at really high volume, you know, so they're giving you a slightly, you know, slightly better price, but they're doing thousands of them and, you know, they're employing anyone they can get their hands on to do these installs. You know, they don't care about quality. So typically those, those words are used to describe um, either installers or companies that um, don't care about um, the installations and the quality and the safety as well. Mate, do you sometimes wake up in the morning and go, gee, this is a tough business because I'm trying to do the right thing by the customer but in this industry, a lot of people are corner cutters mm. and I'm the ro I'm kind of doing the right thing. Mm. But some customers are not even aware about how they're being ripped off. Do you sometimes kind of wonder if going the quality way is the right way? No, never. Um, I'm a firm believer that doing uh, a quality job is the only way long term. If, if you've got any hope of being in this industry over a, over a, a long period, you need to focus on quality and safety. And if you don't, you know, we'll go the way of the dodo and, and, and you'll put yourself out of business because you'll get bad customer reviews, bad experience, the warranty issues will, will kill you. you fo focusing on quality is the only way to ensure that your business is going to be around for a long time. So I take those things Really seriously, it's probably one of the big reasons why we've been around for as long as we have, and so we've taken quality seriously from the start. It's been part of our ethos from day one. I hear that, uh, and I've always admired about you, you're kind of a bit of an innovator. So what are you guys doing innovative in the space for, let's say, EV charging? Yeah, so um, about two years ago, we started working on a product called Solar Up Charge. So um, same name, albeit that with a little um, word tagged on the end. And that's our public charging um, uh, network and, and application. So there's a number of public charges that we've been putting in in the Canberra region, and that's about to expand quite quickly over the next six to 12 months. Um, and those are branded solar hub charge charges. They range from um, your sort of fast AC 22 kilowatt charges right the way up to sort of faster DC 50 to 60 kilowatt um, charges. Um, but like anything Solar Hub does, we've really focused on the customer experience. So um, unfortunately for a lot of the public charging infrastructure, uh, they got a bit of a bad name. Number one, um, people rocking up and they're not on, 
right? So these charges are unavailable. They've got faults. You know, customers can't use them because they're down and they're waiting on parts. Um, people aren't supporting the network. So um, this has been a bit of a blight on the charging industry for the, f- the past few years is, is that the, the actual public charges themselves have been reasonably unreliable. So we focused again on testing to make sure that the charges we're using are fit for purpose and reliable. But again, it comes back to support. We've got technicians there and available that if there is an issue with these charges that we're out there fixing it, you know, um, as quickly as we can to get that back up and running. So these charges um, can be accessed via our app. You can download it from um, the Apple or Android stores. It's called Solar Hub Charge. It allows you to tap on to these charges, um, put in your credit card details and um, plug your car in and, and off you go. You can charge your car at one of these public charging stations and there's about to be a lot more of them put in over the next six to 12 months. Mainly in the ACT? Uh, mainly in the ACT, yeah, but all the way down in our region. So we've already done uh, three down on the south coast. Um, there's one at our head office down there. There's also one at the Cabago Hotel and one at the Browley Brew House. So um, there's three charges down there. And our aim is to have a network across that whole area that we operate in. So, you know, a charger no more than sort of maybe every 100 kilometres, we've got a charger there um, on our network. That's and, the goal. And because you guys do the after-sale service and the support, uh, it shouldn't be that the thing is down and about and sits there for a week or two, is it? Yeah. So we, we've got our um, charging platform up on a, on, a sc- on a screen in our office mm-hmm. and we've got people that are monitoring it constantly. If there's any faults in that charger, we'll know about it and we send someone out to fix it. Mm-hmm. So again, it's about responsiveness. It's about the reliability of the network. It's about having technicians on the ground to be able to fix problems if they crop up. Panel position. I turn up at your house. The front roof is easy. I'll just whack it on there. Is that the way to go? No, um, obviously panels will perform better if they're facing north. I mean, we're in the southern hemisphere, so um, you want them facing north where you can, but that's not always possible. So we 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 try and put them there in the first instance, providing it's not heavily shaded. That's probably the first thing to look at. Have I got lots of really tall trees around my house? I mean, there are times, markers where, you know, we come to a house, we sit down with a customer, um, we do a walk around and... And we politely say, look, sorry, I don't think solar's for you. But hang on, I want to spend my money with you. No, you've got to be prepared to say no because if it's really heavily shaded, then there's just no point doing it, right? So um, there are times where we do walk away and the the irony is we'll often rock up and there'll be six quotes on the kitchen table and you're sitting there scratching your head going, why don't any of these other six companies say, hey, this is not a good idea? So um, we don't say it often, but there are cases where in very heavily wooded or or, or shaded areas, it's not ideal and that's not a good investment. Then it comes back to, well, okay, if, you know, as long as we don't have too much shading or we can mitigate the shading, it's only in one part of the house and not the other, is putting solar panels on the best orientations, right? And that starts with north and obviously then east and west, you know, is, are, are not as optimal, but they're still okay. Look, even if it's slightly southwest, slightly southeast, those, those roof positions are okay too. Um, uh, but ultimately it's about designing a system and when you say what the system's going to do, so we'll put all these orientations into our tool, And it will spit a number out, what you're going to generate in the winter, what you're going to generate in the summer, any sort of shading factors that are applied. You see all this in the data that we provide you when we provide a quote. But it's about being honest about that. You know, the last thing I want is a customer ring up in two years and say, hey, you know, you said the system was going to do X and it and it, and it only only does Y. What's going on? You know, you've, you've got to be upfront with your customers about what that system's going to do. And too often um, I see other companies that put no shading factors on that, you know, even though they're putting panels on the south, they in their tool they model it as north and, you know, they completely lie about what that system's going to do. And customers go, hang on, your system says it's going to do less than this guy. Why is that? I'm like, well, because they haven't done this, this and this. So, so Our quotes on. are conservative but um, on point. So you selling solar ethically? <laughs> I know it's hard to imagine, you know, but... In this industry? Yeah, it's, in, in my view, again, coming back to longevity, we've been around for such a long time now. If we'd approached by uh, lying to customers about what their systems are going to do, overstating the savings people were going to have, then we wouldn't be here because people would have, you know, rounded us on social media or on Google reviews or not told their friends about how good we are and we wouldn't be standing here today. So if you want to be in this business for the long time, you've got to be honest, you've got to be upfront, you've got to be ethical. Wow. You're the first guy 
I've heard say that. No, I'm not kidding. <laughs> All the companies that are there in solar for a long time, who've done the decade plus, who survived the solar coaster, those companies, that's their philosophy. So you're not actually the only one. There are good companies all around Australia who follow go local, go quality, sell with ethics. They're the key things. Oh, we're definitely not the only only one. I know lots of companies. Um, you know, I've been in industry long enough to have, you know, quite a few close friends in the industry and, <clears throat> you know, there's plenty of good operators out there. Mm. Uh, again, uh, I think the biggest differentiator I see between – the quality ones that I know um, and the ones that I know aren't is how long they've been in the market. Mm. That's the key thing. Mm. You know, if they've been over five, good. If they've been over 10, fantastic, right? Those are the companies you want to find. Mm. 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 So if you would advise a friend at a dinner party, how do I get a good solo and battery deal? What are your top five tips? Um, pick a local installer. Number one, mm. uh, pick a company that's been around um, for a good period of time, five years minimum. It's number two. Pick a company that's got their licenses. This is something that just amazes me. The amount of – in New South Wales, for example, it's actually mandatory to have a New South Wales electrical contractor's license if you're selling solar. This isn't if you're installing it. This is if you're selling it. It amazes the amount of companies that don't have this. And um, unfortunately, it's not well enforced, right? So get the name of their company. Look, Go on to the New South Wales Fair, Fair, Fair Trading website. You can look this stuff up. Enter the name. Find their contractor's license. Mm. If they've got a contractor's license, it's usually a pretty good sign, right, that they've got their own installers, their own electricians on staff, and they've got some, got some skin in the game. Those are the top three things that mm. you need to focus mm. on. On product... Look at what is out there. Look at what your friends and family have done. Ask them about their experiences. I don't think this is done enough. Don't be afraid to tap into your networks, mm. you know. And if someone says, hey, don't go with this company, listen. <laughs> That's a reason. <laughs> uh. You know, don't then go and do it anyway because they got a good deal, right? Mm. If someone's had a bad experience, it's probably going to be replicated over and over and over again. Mm. Mm. So listen to those networks. Read their worst reviews. Yeah, but but what about the other way? If a friend and family says I had a good experience with that company, uh, look, I would definitely look at them. I mm. mean, if they've had a really good experience, and definitely look at them. But don't take that as the only thing either. As I said, make sure you do all these other checks too. Mm. Sometimes, the dare I say it, the cowboys do remarkably pull off a good install for one customer. It does happen. It's rare, but it can happen. So you've got to do all of these checks. Now, but the other thing is also if you just had the system installed, yeah. maybe the roof leaks haven't come through yeah. and all of that. So I think talking to family and friends who had the system installed for a number of years yeah, sure. and the system's been reliable and yeah. there were no issues afterwards. Well, even better is if they'd had a little issue and that customer responded and fixed it. That's even better in my opinion. You mean the installer? The installer, yeah. If, yeah, if, if yeah. the installer's been back out there and supported mm. and answered the phone, that's a really good sign too because yeah. as I said, no – no installer, no install uh, is going to be completely bereft of issues for its whole lifetime. You are going to have some things that go wrong and it's how people respond. Let's say I've decided Solar Hub are the right company to install my solar, my battery and my EV charger. Mm. Now, I want to know what to expect on the morning. Mm. Are you guys going to do it in two hours, mm. in three days? Mm. Are there four guys? Are there 50 guys? Tell me the story. So we, from the time someone... Um, purchases a system off us and as I said, most might be a air conditioner or a, a solar system and an EV charger, it then goes into our review process. So we then have a number of people that review it, make sure we've dotted the I's, crossed the T's, make sure there's no issues. We then put in the approval paperwork. That's the, the next thing. So often that's sending it off to your network operator to make sure that we've got the right approvals to install your system. So we do that. Then we make sure we've got the gear. <laughs> we Often it's in the warehouse, sometimes it's not. Sometimes there's specialty things we've got to order in. So we, we make sure we've, we've got that gear and then we schedule um, our installers to go out. Now, depending on the situation, it can all be done in a day. You know, We have done nearly full home electrifications in a, in a day, in a single day. Quite often though, it does take more than a day if you're going to do a full home electrification, right? So a solar and battery system can generally done, be done you know, before two o'clock in the afternoon, DV charger might take a couple more hours. 
But an air conditioning is a whole other crew, right? Particularly for a duct system, and that's going to take the minimum of a day, sometimes a little bit, a little bit longer. So we will always coordinate um, those resources. We'll talk to customers, um, make sure they're home, make sure they're available, um, make sure they've if they've got any questions or there's dogs that need to be secured, you know, for when we're there. We we help them through that process and and lead them through every step um, of the way. But it generally takes minimum a day to do a sort of solar and battery. And then if we're doing full home electrification, air con, hot water, it generally takes at least two days. And yeah. thorough communication all the way through. Of course. You know, I'm a firm believer. And not just that, we, you know, as soon as we finish the job, someone's on the phone the next day to make sure that the customer understands mm. what they've purchased, whether they've got any questions about how to use it. I mean, our installers do a good job of handing that over on the day, but, you know, often until you actually start using an app or playing with the controller for the aircon, you don't really have all the questions there immediately. So we're always there to answer questions you know, for the days after when you start getting familiar with the system that you've purchased. Sounds good. Um, there is going to be what's called an EV revolution coming. I mean, we've taken off slowly now with EVs, but I think it's inevitable. How's that going to affect the whole electronic infrastructure of the home, solar sizing, batteries, the mm. whole thing? Well, EVs um, will need to be charged, you know, and the ideal place to do that is from a solar system. So that's the first thing is mm. having the charging infrastructure in the home. And, and that's just one direction that's coming from, from solar or from the grid if you need it as a backup and having a charging point in your garage or wherever you park your car and the ability to plug your car in. So mm. that's the first thing. Where the revolution is going to come is when we start talking about power flows in the other direction. So people talk about vehicle to home, V to H, vehicle to grid, V to G. And they talk about, they use these acronyms to talk about energy flows that start coming from the car, either into the home or in some cases, maybe all the way into the grid to take advantage of very high feed-in tariffs at certain times of the day. So that's, I think, the big revolution. We're, you know, we're installing EV chargers every day mm. now for mm. people that buy new cars. And they're working well. You know, they charge their car overnight. They charge their car on the weekend. We can put smart charging on to charge it from the solar if there's excess. We can do these things now. The big revolution is going to come when we start thinking about these cars, not as cars, but as batteries. You know, they're big batteries on wheels that move around and that battery is the most valuable part of that car. It's a big energy bank and if you um, control the flows of energy in and out of that car, right, you can actually make some money or at least reduce your bills. Mm. Mm. Wow. So there's a lot of change coming in that field going forward, is it? There is. There's a lot of trials um, at the moment on um, vehicle to grid. So, um, you know, cars um, exporting power from the car into the home and, and then into the grid. So th those things are happening now. Um, there's a bit of standards, you know, like anything that have got to play catch up here to make sure we've got the right standards in place, make sure we've got the safety right for these things before, you know, we implement them widespread. But in the next two to three years, we're going to see a lot of uh, innovation in that vehicle to grid, vehicle to home space. Wow, wow. Um, Canberra, I don't know, you don't really have a big manufacturing industry, et cetera, but do you guys do commercial solar for Solar Hub? Yeah, so we've been doing commercial solar since the get-go. Um, I was actually only driving uh, down um, uh, through Barton in Canberra the other day and I drove past the first commercial system we did on a, on a block of units there. It was a um, it was a 20 kilowatt system. I remember at the time it was it was big. You know, this is probably 2013, 2014, something around there. I remember at the time we were like, you know, you're just selling, you know, three, four, five kilowatt systems to homeowners. And, you know, this is the, one of the first big systems that we did, you know, and I thought 20 kilowatt was kilowatts was big back then. I was super proud of it. In fact, it's still running. You know, the system's fine. Um, had no issues with it um, since we installed it. Um, but yeah, now we're doing much bigger systems. You know, we're doing, commonly we're doing 100 kilowatt systems on factories, but we do right the way up to half megawatt projects as well, 500 kilowatts on, on factories and commercial buildings. Um, so yes, it's a, a big part of our business. It's actually a growing part of our business as well. Um, you know, businesses, if we think homeowners have been paying a lot for electricity, you should see what businesses are paying for electricity. They're paying even more in some cases and then being slapped with things like demand charges as well. Um, I think in, in the ACT recently, some of the renewed contracts for businesses have gone up in the order of 30 to 40% in one year, right? So, uh, and other 
big thing with businesses is they're using most of their power during the daytime, right? So homes, generally it's weighted more to sort of mornings and afternoons is when the high power demands are, but businesses, it's right in the middle of the day. And guess what's happening in the middle of the day? That's when the solar is at its best. So we do find that um, solar paybacks for businesses are actually lower than they are for homeowners. So um, I, I sometimes scratch my head as to why not every business has done it already because the savings are huge for businesses, every business. And we could talk about um, child care centers who use electricity during the day, yep. um, swimming schools with pools, yep. uh, car mechanics would use quite a bit mm -hmm. of electricity. Yep. So it's those type of businesses? Or? It's, it's all businesses, Marcus. It's, it's, it's those retail businesses, it's government businesses, it's government buildings, it's, you know, it's unit blocks, it's factories, it's warehouses and industrial districts. It's all of those types of businesses that would benefit from solar. I don't think we've sort of come across one <laughs> where, the, mm. where the payback, you know, doesn't impress every sort of CFO that we run the proposal under. Usually they get scratching the head going, well, why have I not done this earlier? Like for businesses, it's, it's, as I said, the payback's better than for most homeowners. So it's something every business owner should be looking at. Mm, mm. What about solar and batteries in the commercial space? Is that coming up? It is, but it, it doesn't actually make as much sense, ironically, mm. because um, they're using most of the solar during the day. For a lot of businesses, we um, they, they're really high energy users. You think about factories, they're using a lot of energy, right? So we'll fill the roof up with solar, And usually they don't have a lot of export. There's not a lot that generally needs to go mm. back to the grid. Mm. So mm. the case for batteries is is a little bit more remote um, and commercial. There's some uh, uh, commercial businesses that do benefit from batteries, but for the most part, going big on the solar is generally the best thing they can do. Mm -hmm. So give me some of the big Canberra companies that have used Solar Hub for their commercial. A little birdie told me you did something for the Canberra Raiders. Yes. So we did... Um, multiple uh, jobs for the Canberra Raiders. Um, they've obviously got a lot of clubs around Canberra and we did a bunch of sites for them. Um, the Canberra Airport is probably the one that's most notice noticeable. We've done a whole heap of installations um, for the Canberra Airport. Recently, uh, we did the National Museum of Australia. I don't know how familiar you are with Canberra, but um, we did an installation there um, also for the National Gallery. Uh, it's another sort of well-known uh, well name. And... Uh, the ANU as well, so the Australian National University. We've done quite a few installations um, for the ANU. And in addition to that, we've done uh, probably 20 or 30 schools around Canberra as well over the years under various school programs. So um, quite a well-known, a lot of well-known businesses that we've dealt with. They're often return customers. You know, they've got um, upgrades and additional sites that they want to put us in. So, yeah, we do get a lot of return business in Canberra as well. So they're all very reputable companies and businesses. They would have done their due diligence. So the fact that they all picked you, yeah, um, that's a good sign. It is. I mean, I, I think we've got a lot of experience, but I think the big thing is, you know, we're very big on safety and this is really important more so for businesses. They take this stuff really seriously. If you're mm. going to be on their building, it's a work site. You know, they certainly don't want you cutting corners on on safety and quality. They have generally got their own facilities managers, their own internal auditors, their own, you know, work safe people. So um, we find that uh, uh, the quality and safety aspects really step us above most of our competitors and that we take these things seriously. We've got really good processes. We're ISO accredited, all this sort of stuff. So, um, and businesses take that seriously and, and value that. So I think that's why we do so well in the commercial space. Well, yeah. Okay. Ben, you've been basically riding the solar coaster and now the battery coaster for over a decade. Mm. If you put your little wise glasses on, what's coming over the horizon in the next two to five years? It's electrification. This is the, the buzzword, um, but I can't stress enough that the government's setting some very um, aggressive objectives to get Australia off gas. Um, ACT in Victoria in particular are quite aggressive in setting their, their targets for actually switching the gas off. Now, my trajectories, you know, you, you take what the government says with a grain of salt, but the trajectories I have, um, I um, think that the rate of electrification needs to be much quicker than what the government's saying now. And like anything, the government are going to get, you know, five years out from the target and go, oh, no, you know, we need to incentivize this even further. We need to put more money on the table. So I think this electrification space is going to really take off. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of money um, thrown at it by both state and territory and, and federal governments over the next few years. So that's 
that's the big takeaway. EVs, yes, you know, that's obviously another space um, that's going to take off. But I think for our business, the where we're going to see a lot of growth is in is in the electrification side. So air conditioning, heat pumps, solar batteries, cooktops. So instead of just a solar system being bolted on, yeah. it becomes really the whole energy footprint. So when yeah. somebody walks in, that's what they analyze. They're not just flogging your quick cookie cutter system. Mm. Are you guys equipped to explain all that to end customers? It's hard and we've had to skill up a lot. We've had to do a lot of training um, with our teams to get ourselves um, skilled up on on air conditioning and hot water, these things that, you know, I guess weren't our traditional lines of business. But we've done that work already. We built some new systems as well, which help us assess and analyze those energy savings, have a look at people's bills. We've done all that legwork. So we're really um, ready to hit the ground running on this now. Um, and I think, yeah, coming to one provider f to do the whole thing uh, is going to be really valuable for people because, you know, you, you think about if you want to go and get a hair con, you go get six quotes and then you want to swap your hot water and you get another six quotes and, you know, you want to do your solar and you get another six quotes. I mean, that's 18 quotes, you know, 18 companies that you're going to have to deal with, then trying to pick which ones you go with and they don't, the left hand doesn't talk to the right hand. This is really where I think we're going to come into our own is providing that turnkey end-to-end -end electrification solution for homeowners. That's what we're focusing on. So then if anything goes wrong, I know I've got to call you because yep. you're taking that responsibility. And we're happy to. We've sold you a good product. So, you know, we're not going to get many of those calls. So we're happy to answer them when you do ring. Mm -hmm. Sounds solar hub is right for me. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> ben, look, I like your passion. I, you really care for the end customer. Um, I would feel I'm in good hands if I'd use you. Unfortunately, I don't, can't afford a house in Canberra yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, you've got a big house in, in, in Sydney, don't you? <laughs> Thanks, Marcus. Thank Thanks you. for having me on. Thank you. Please support the channel by liking the video, hit that subscribe button and ring the bell and check out all our other videos. Want more Energy Answered? Visit yourenergyanswers.com for quality energy products, tools and calculators and find your quality local installers. You're still here? I'll see you next time. Bye.